Saturday is only four days away. I concede that there is some possibility that I am having a midlife crisis. I don't think that's the case, but it's a possibility. Saturday morning, my wife will take the kids to her parents' house for spring break. Saturday afternoon, I finally get to meet Crystal. We've been preparing for this for months, and I've been preparing for this for years. Jenna was amazing when we met and married, but we've been drifting apart for quite some time now. The sex life that used to be exciting and fulfilling has dwindled to the point where I no longer look forward to it as much as I used to. It used to be the centerpiece of our time together. Now, I know I want it, but I can't remember why. I have no doubt why I want to do it with Crystal. Just the thought of being with her gives me an instant erection, something I have to try my hardest to avoid when I see her at work. We've been flirting for a few months now. I think I finally got the courage to approach her when I bought my new Porsche. I saw how much she admired it and offered her a ride. She is very attractive and has a great body, which is to be expected from a 25-year-old girl. Not that Jenna is promiscuous, but Crystal has the same young body that she likes to show off in tight, skimpy clothes that can barely be called business attire. When I hit 40, I realized this was the only body I would ever have and started exercising regularly. So now, I'm in pretty good shape at 42. I realized there was no reason to wait any longer for the car I'd always dreamed of, so I bought it. Sure, I can't take more than one passenger but I felt so good behind the wheel that I never questioned my decision. Crystal has the same exciting life as a bachelor, and this weekend, I get to share some of that life with her. I hope I get to share a week with her as well. We have dinner and a club trip planned for Saturday night, and I'm hoping that we can do something in the afternoon that I knew for sure we would do later that evening. How different it will be from the home life I seem to be immersed in, soccer, drama class, the mall, and I don't even want to think about where else I'll have to take the girls. Jenna drives too, but it's also time-consuming, bills to pay, repairs to make, clothes to pick up, needing my parents. It's not what I signed up for when I said love. At least this time, I won't have to visit her parents. Even without plans to see Crystal, it would almost turn my week into a holiday. They'd never thought I was good enough for their daughter, and in the 18 years I'd known them, I'd never once felt any real affection from them. They should have given you a manual to read before you got married. They give you an instruction manual before you take your driving test, and driving is a lot easier than being married. When we got married, Jenna was 25, had a body just like Crystal's now, and I constantly wanted to take her clothes off. Now it's sweatpants, white gym socks, and an old drab t-shirt that she uses for cleaning or just lounging around. Even if it wasn't any passion, we want to express has to be done with the obstacle of two teenage girls in the house. I still love Jenna, and I'm sure she still loves me, but something is missing. Since I only get one chance in this life, I believe I deserve it all, and I think Crystal can give me a lot of what I've been missing. I don't know what to associate that queasy feeling in my stomach with. I'm sure this is what I want to do, and I don't think I have any doubts. Wednesday morning, I think I slept through my alarm clock. It wasn't a queasy feeling, I have serious stomach cramps. I need to get to the bathroom before it becomes a real mess. It hurts so bad that I bend over on the way to the bathroom. I feel nauseous, but at least I'm not throwing up. I have to go back to bed, I can barely stand on my feet. It's so hard to fall asleep, I have to go to the bathroom all the time. The clock says 1.30, and it's light outside, so it must be noon. Even under all these blankets, I'm freezing. I stick my head under the blanket to catch my warm breath in hopes of beating this brutal cold. It works, and I manage to pull my head back out so it doesn't smell so nasty. I should drink something so I don't get dehydrated, but I don't have the energy to go downstairs and climb back up. I hear a car door close outside, and then the voices of a man and a woman. Then I hear scrabbling on the front door lock and voices coming inside. Oh my god. Jenna brought a man into the house, not expecting me to be here. She's having an affair. No wonder we don't get along. She's having a damn affair, and I'm about to catch her. So much for the guilt. Thank god, there you are. When I called you at work, they didn't know where you were or why you didn't show up. 
I can't tell you about all the terrible things I thought had happened to you, Jenna says as she comes in, accompanied by Ed Wilson, who lives three houses away. If she was so worried, why didn't she send him? Maybe because he doesn't have a key. Well, Jen, I see there are no burglars, so I'm going to go home, Ed says quickly. She calls on the phone, Roger's here. He's sick, he was probably too sick to call and say he'll be out. Yeah, I'll call when I know better how long he'll be gone. Bye, she says and hangs up. I guess if she knows I skipped work and didn't call, she won't be stupid enough to bring home a lover. She walks over and runs her hand through my hair. Poor baby, she says. Ah, stop it. It hurts, I reply. What can I get you? Something to drink? Have you been drinking anything? Can you hold it down, she asks. I'm nauseous, but I haven't thrown up yet, I say. I'll get you some ginger ale. If we don't have any, I'll run to the store and get some, she says. My skin aches from the pressure of the sheets, the skin on my face aches from the pressure of the air passing over it, and all my muscles ache. She returns with a glass of ginger ale. I can't take more than a couple sips before my stomach starts to ache again. The need overwhelms me, and I rush to the bathroom. Back in bed, I mercifully fall asleep. I always prefer to sleep through the sickness and wake up when I feel better. When I wake up, she is already there in her leave-me-alone outfit. She has a dish of lime jello and a spoon for me. It smells delicious, but I need to go to the bathroom right away. This time, it's really bad. By the time it drains out of my ass and I quickly wipe myself, I have to turn around and puke on it. It's long, and I can barely catch my breath, but it keeps coming. It was so fast that I didn't have time to collect it all in a bowl, some of it ended up on the seat, some on the floor. Damn! I have to go again, and there's no time to clean up. I'm covered in vomit, but at least I managed to get it all in a bowl. I wipe my ass, and there's Jenna kneeling over me with a warm rag, wiping me off. She wipes me off with the towel and helps me back onto the bed. My head is killing me, everything is killing me. I'll be right back. I need to go to the bathroom to clean the carpet, she says. I don't have the energy to stay conscious. It's already getting dark, but it's still light enough that I can make out the glass of ginger ale on the night table. I take only a couple of sips. I can feel it sinking down so cold it quickly reaches my stomach, and my stomach is not happy. It starts to hurt again. I don't know which end will be up first, but I know where I'm going. Both ends. At least this time, I'm not messing up my surroundings. The carpet is damp or I puked on it, but it smells nice. Certainly much better than I did. I get a brief respite before I throw up again. I think that's the most apt description as it continues to lash out and there's nothing I can do to stop it. I feel a hand run down my neck, soothing me. I don't know if my skin hurts because I'm mostly immersed in the strong contractions of my stomach, chest, shoulders, and back. Thankfully, it ends, and she holds out toilet paper for me to wipe myself. I flush, and she holds out a paper cup of mouthwash for me. I rinse my mouth out, and at least that incredibly nasty taste is gone. My throat is a little scratchy, but at least it tastes minty. Jenna helps me back into bed, and before we can talk, I'm asleep. The TV comes on, and I notice it's law and order. It must be past 10. Jenna notices I'm awake and walks over, handing me a ginger ale. Try it again. You should try to avoid dehydration. That's how people get seriously sick from something like this. I feel like I'm already seriously ill, but I know she means dehydration can be life-threatening. I feel it sink in again, but it's no longer as painful when it hits my stomach. Are you hungry at all? Can I offer you some jello? No, thanks. I'm not hungry at all. Is there anything I can do to help? No, what's the story? I ask. A guy abused his wife, killed his little daughter, but they couldn't prove it, so he only got 15 years. He got hit by a car, and they focused on his social worker from prison. The guy got out of the nursing home early and is living with a girlfriend who has kids, 
which he's not allowed to do, she explains. Thank you. By the end, all the prosecutors are convinced the social worker did it. I think it might have been her husband. God, I managed to stay conscious for half an hour, maybe I'm getting better. I don't make it to the 11 o'clock news. Over the next few hours, I make four more, less eventful, trips to the bathroom. That seems to be all that keeps me from sleeping non-stop. Well, I make it through the morning. I managed to drink an almost full glass of ginger ale. I wonder how many days it will be before I'm completely dried out. I got goosebumps again, maybe I will be dried out. I don't know how she knew I was awake, but here comes Jenna with a fresh glass of ginger ale and a plate of jello. This time, I think I'm going to try to eat something. I take the plate and spoon and slowly eat. Jenna walks over to the closet and appears with another blanket. I think she sees me shivering. Damn, that was good, I think to myself. I suspect it was mostly good because of the fact that I was able to eat nothing. I can't believe I got full from a crappy little snack bowl. I can only take a sip or two, and nothing else will fit. She lies down on the other side of the bed, settles in behind me, and wraps her arms around me to share her warmth. The shivering subsides. I hear the girls eating breakfast in the kitchen and getting ready for school. So much sleep, and still, I'm tuckered out again. After a while, I wake up to go on another trip to the bathroom. It's so tiring that I need to go back to bed to rest before traveling downstairs. I want something to eat while I'm resting. Jenna walks into the room. What time is it? Don't you have to go to work? I took the day off to take care of you. You were too sick for me to leave you alone. Can I get you anything? Would you like some chicken broth or toast? I think I'll make do with jello for now, I reply, my voice shaking. I think if I threw up a couple more times, I wouldn't have any voice left at all. While she's gone, I assess the situation, all my muscles ache, my skin is still tender, my throat burns, and I have no strength. The chills have passed. Overall, I feel a little better. I slice the jello, take a couple sips, and don't feel terrible. I don't feel good, but I don't feel terrible either. Is there anything else I can do for you? No, I'm fine. Relatively. We're watching a little Tony Danza show, but I'm not paying attention. I'm starting to feel worse and worse. I'm really hot this time. I pull back the extra blanket, but I'm so hot I start dripping. I don't know how she manages to get in and out of the room without me noticing, but Jenna is right next to me again and puts a cool washcloth on my forehead. I wasn't sure if you could take aspirin, so I figured this would help, she says. It does. She makes three more attempts to refresh the washcloth before I cool down. Despite this, all I want to do is sleep, even though I've slept most of the day. I have a vague feeling that she was here. I make a few more runs, but it doesn't seem like there's anything else left to come out. Jenna turns on Dr. Phil. Do you think you're ready to try the soup? While you were sleeping, I bought some salted bread so you can eat them with the soup. I think the girls will be happy to see that you probably won't die if you can handle it. I think I can handle it. I'll come back for you when it's ready. It wasn't long before I was able to climb downstairs without help. Where are the girls? I changed my mind. They were arguing, but I don't want to risk them noticing, Jenna says. Good point. What about you? I did what I had to do. You needed me, and I took the risk. What can I say? I finish my soup and crackers and get full pretty quickly, but I don't feel terrible. I'm on the road to recovery. Jenna sits back and watches me. I go back upstairs while she cleans up. When I get into bed, I notice that my legs feel like jelly, but they don't hurt anymore. My skin is fine too. The remote is on the table by the chair under the window. I don't feel like getting in there, so I sit in silence. Not for long. Jenna sits down in the chair and turns on the TV. I may not have much energy, but tonight I managed to stay awake until almost the 11 o'clock news. I'm going to bed, Jenna says. 
I'm going to work tomorrow. You look well enough to take care of yourself. She gets up, hands me the remote, and runs her hand through my hair. Are you sleeping in the guest room? Yes. I'm willing to take the risk, but I don't have to make it worse by sleeping next to you. I felt much better. I slept until 10 o'clock, but I don't feel stupefied when I wake up. I can make it up too, maybe three flights of stairs. I call work to make sure they know I'm not coming in. I can't talk to Crystal without arousing suspicion, all calls go through the switchboard. She doesn't call me either. They monitor outgoing phone calls as well as our internet usage. Isn't it a wonderful world we live in? Every now and then, I take a nap, but mostly I'm distracted by daytime television. If I had to watch that crap for any extended period of time, I think I'd kill myself. I know I'm home and can get around, but I don't have the energy to make dinner. The girls don't come home right after school, and I wonder what their activities are this time. They come in with Jenna. I think she's taken them from everywhere. They want to throw themselves at me, but Jenna tells them not to get too close. None of our protests convince her to back off. You can't be too careful. Yes, you can, but I'm not going to win this argument, so I don't bother. After dinner, I go back to the bedroom and watch TV again. I'd read a book, but I think it would put me to sleep even easier than TV. Tonight, I can get the remote if I need to. Hell, I can even walk over to the TV and manually change channels if I want to or figure out how to. Jenna walks in and packs an impressive suitcase. It's enough for a week. She tells me she's looking forward to visiting her parents. Better than me, I respond with insincere regret that I can't join them. She knows it's insincere. I know she knows it is. She leaves the bedroom at 10 o'clock. She wants an early start. I turn off the TV. My symptoms are gone, only fatigue remains. I get a good night's sleep. Jenna wakes me up to say goodbye and kisses me on the forehead, then goes to the bathroom to wash her hands and mouth. Go boldly, but always with caution. It's still a little early for me, so after saying goodbye to the girls, I fall asleep for a little while longer. I wake up at 10.30, completely refreshed. I can't go golfing, but I can get back to my normal routine. Crystal waits for me around 1, if she still thinks I'm coming. No phone calls, no sign of her. My first shower since Tuesday seems delightful, and I can't tear myself away from it. I get dressed and think about the last few days. They've been brutal. I wouldn't want to experience that again, especially the first two days. Thank God Jenna was there for me. I could have done it without her, but it wouldn't have been pretty. Fine. I grab a small bag and pack enough stuff for the weekend. I don't need as much as Jenna does. She could live for a month on what she packed. I lock up the house and hop in the Porsche. I start the car a few times to hear its power. Why have a car like this if you can't enjoy the sound of it? And then, I drive away. Sometimes I like to take it out just to drive and enjoy the fact that I own it and can go wherever I want. When I drive a Porsche, I don't take any shortcuts that would cut down on the fun of driving. I'm on the road for hours at a time, sometimes changing gears just to listen to the sound. Finally, I arrive at my destination. I go to the door and ring the bell. The door opens. Dad, a voice shouts happily. Okay, I was having a midlife crisis. The thought of having marvelous sex with Crystal was tempting, and it would be wonderful. It would be new and dangerous and forbidden and wild. But when you compare that to what I stand to lose with Jenna, missing out on that is nothing. Even if she puts up with my behavior, she doesn't deserve it. Either way, I'll sit down with her, and we'll talk and figure out how to get back the zest we've been missing. Just because I'm a guy going through a midlife crisis next to an available, desirable woman doesn't mean I have to be stupid. And just because I'm not talking about it doesn't mean I haven't learned anything in the last few days. I wonder what kind of trade-in I can get on a Porsche.